Hey, it's Dr. Kate Walker. I was trying to live stream on uh, in our Facebook group, but Facebook does not want to cooperate today. So if you are watching this on a replay, awesome. I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad you're trying to learn something new. I'm going to talk about business plans for supervisors. So one of the things I think that holds people back from becoming a supervisor, because I know you want to do all the things. I know you want to get back to the community. I know that those four walls of the therapy room are kind of crushing in on you, but you don't want to take on another client because your plate's all, already full. You've been doing this for at least five years. Maybe you're looking for another challenge, but the only business plan lots of us have ever heard of when it comes to uh, doing this job, doing supervision, is adding more supervisees. And that's not a good idea when you're just starting out, right? Um, supervisors go through the same developmental phases as our supervisees. We are level one at one time. We are level two at one time. It takes a few hours of supervision before you can start to get really comfortable with the whole process and you develop amazing systems, you're familiar with the OER triad, you have um, the, your remediation plan is ship shape. So until you get those systems in place because of experience and consultation and all the things, or maybe you read my new book, the Clinical Supervision Survival Guide, and you're like, oh my gosh, I have all of these great ideas now. Well, until you get to the place where you are super comfortable with your systems, it's probably a good idea not to base your brand new supervision practice on lots and lots and lots of supervisees. You know, and I could go into all of the reasons why. And I know some very experienced supervisors who have many supervisees and they are killing it. They're doing a wonderful job. But I could also show you all of the systems they have in place that allows them to do the amazing job that they're doing. So if you're going into supervision and you're thinking, OK, the only way I'm going to make money doing this is to have a ton of supervisees, you're wrong. And I'm going to prove you wrong in the most gentle, wonderful, nurturing way. And I'm going to show you other ways you can create a thriving supervision practice or you can use your S, the designation supervisor, to open up other streams of income, even passive streams of income in your practice that will complement what you're already doing. It will still increase the impact on your community, but now it's actually going to increase the impact on your profession because you're paying it forward, you're paying it back, and you're going to be satisfied. I mean, that's the only way I can put it. I just got back from walking the Camino in Santiago, Spain. I mean, I know I'm saying that all wrong. I'm still a little bit jet lagged. And one of the things that really became clear to me as I was walking this, I think we ended up walking a total of 70 miles in five days, is the idea you can't cope yourself out of burnout. All right, if you are already seeing clients and your schedule is full and you want something more because you're burning out, like I said, the walls are kind of closing in, you know, deep breathing, meditation, they're all wonderful things, but burnout can't be coped away. You have to restructure how you work. And this may be one of those episodes where I get a lot of pushback and I welcome pushback because you guys are awesome and you always push back in a way that's constructive and I always learn something. So I'm, I might stand on this soapbox for just a minute though. Uh, this is a quote I actually read by Adam Grant today. And, you know, the idea is, you know, maybe we shouldn't cope with burnout. Maybe uh, burnout is something where we really need to change how we are practicing, how we're doing business. And so, you know, by the end of this, I do want you to have an idea about how you can use an S, how you can use the supervisor designation to not just increase your income, not just increase your impact on the, the community and the profession. Y'all, I want you to take care of yourself. I want you to think of supervision as a way to combat burnout. So, this supervisor designation, what I'm going to talk about is actually from a course that I have 
called What to Charge for Supervision. I know that sounds kind of weird. It's like, okay, what to charge for supervision? How does that relate to business plans? Well, because when you're a supervisor, right, and you're, you're a brand new S and you're trying to get those supervisees, you're trying to, you know, open your store, so to speak, I'm making air quotes in uh, at the camera right now, you have to stand out in a buyer's market. So in Texas, the limitations on uh, supervising via a camera, web, webcam, all of that's been taken away. I mean, LMFT supervision is still limited uh, as far as using the phone for supervision, right? But as far as using technical technological means to deliver supervision, the limits are gone. And so what that means is you can have anybody in the state as your supervisee and anybody in the state can have you. So it's not like, okay, I'm in this little town and I only have one choice for a supervisor. I mean, in Texas, you don't have to work where your supervisor works. You can have a supervisor in any part of the state. You can make sure that you're interviewing your supervisor so it's a good fit. So yeah, I'm talking to supervisors right now. You have to stand out. It is a buyer's market. So I am gonna talk about ways you can supervise to stand out because that is a business plan, right? You're wanting to stand out in the crowd. But I'm also going to talk about how you can use that supervisor designation to add income without burning you out. So one of the things it, I, they kind of go together is to offer telehealth and to consider a specialty. So as your business plan for supervising in Texas, you know, our supervisees can own and operate their own business. And uh, the podcast that's going out this week, um, I'll have the episode in the show notes. It talks about how we can help our supervisees become good business people. Is it required as far as our clinical duties? No, right? But it impacts the relationship if you, oh, I don't know, forgot to tell your supervisee how to file taxes or you didn't give them any assistance marketing and they never got clients and so they got discouraged and went out of business. So if you have a specialty, like if this is a second career for you or a third career and you have... Uh, interest in marketing, or you have a specialty in web design, or you're an amazing photographer and you're able to take headshots, and you're able to offer that as a specialty to up and coming LPC associates, that's amazing. That's going to help you stand out in the crowd. So I say offering telemedicine because I still get a few supervisors every once in a while who's like, you know, they're, they're you know, I'm not going to offer any of that telemedicine. I want my supervisee here in person so I can lay eyes on them. And there are so many reasons to not have that attitude, right? So one business plan, if you're just going to do supervision, is to consider those two things. Offer telehealth, offer supervision via webcam, and consider a specialty. So many of our LPC associates, they want to go work with folks with eating disorders. They want to go work uh, with addictions. They want to study EMDR. They want to study all of these specialty areas, working with couples, working with couples surviving infidelity, working with the ethical polyamorous community. There, there are just so many things that our LPC associates are coming out of grad school and they think that they're just going to find their supervisor who specializes and it's really, really hard for them. Now, we do have the Texas Supervisor Coalition Supervisor Directory where you can list your specialty and that's a great resource. Uh, but I don't know of a lot of supervision directories. In fact, I don't know of any that will help you advertise your specialty. So word of mouth, joining groups like the Texas Supervisor Coalition, posting in the web pages, uh, I'm thinking, you know, I'm not saying it right, the social media threads where you can talk about your specialty. That's an amazing way to stand out from the crowd. So if you're a supervisor listening to this, or if you're thinking about becoming a supervisor, don't just think about your designation, your S designation. Think about what kind of a specialty can you offer the associates and charge for it. Now, I, I'm of the school, and I'll talk about another uh, business plan here in a second, 
where I don't want to price myself out of the associate's ability to pay, right? They just finished grad school. They may have a ton of student debt, student loan debts. But if you're going to mentor someone into having their own private practice and you have an expertise in marketing or graphic design or SEO or any of those things, you can charge accordingly. You can require more supervision meetings. So in Texas, for an LPC associate, they must meet with you for a minimum of four hours per month, LMFT associates, every single week. So if you're offering a specialty and you say, well, okay, as long as your developmental level is one, you're a beginner, I need you to put in six hours of supervision until you meet this criteria on this assessment, then we can talk about reducing it. So in that way, you're able to stand out from the crowd, you're able to make additional income, you're able to make sure that you're providing a really a needed service to those grad students who are coming out, hoping they can find the supervisor who has the specialty that they need. Um, so private practice mentoring, uh, having a specialty in an area like EMDR or couples or addiction or eating disorders or something like that. And then of course, Offering telehealth, especially if you're wanting to reach rural Texas, if you're wanting to get supervisees who are willing to go uh, deliver services in underserved Texas. Now, the model you've heard me talk about before, I am not a tax specialist, I'm not an attorney, I'm not going to tell you the right way to do this or the wrong way to do this, but I call it the ends place model. And if you are one of those a therapist who, you know, you're burning out anyway, you have it up to here and you're like, Kate, I cannot add one more thing. Well, one of the things to consider is looking at your office and the times when you're not using it. Okay. So let's say Saturday morning, right? So at least I hope you're not using it on a Saturday morning. I'm just going to guess here. So let's imagine you have Saturday from noon to three wide open. Well, tell your LPC associate to be, right? Because this is before you guys agree to be supervisor and supervisee. Let them know, hey, look, I will let you use my office and see clients. I need you to donate three direct hours a week. And if you can donate three direct hours a week, you can use my office. I'll help you get clients. Then I will give you free supervision. All right. Now, what happens when those clients come in? Well, those clients are coming to your practice. This isn't your associate's practice. This is income that's coming into your practice. All right. So you're following me. If this is a cash-based exchange, right? So let's say you're offering services to this associate's clients on a sliding scale. And let's say for those three hours on a Saturday, you make, let's say you charge $30 per session for that associate's session, right? For those clients, three times 30, that's $90. That's what you would have made supervising this associate. But now look at your community. Right now your community has had three families helped. Your supervisee now has three direct hours of private practice experience. Now, you may say, yeah, but, but Kate, they're never going to get all their direct hours if they're just working in my office three hours a week. Well, no, they're not. That's the point. You want them to go out and get the majority of their experience and their hours at a hospital, at an agency, some place where they're going to see other diagnoses, get other experience with other site supervisors, have that colleague experience. So yeah, you want them to go get the majority of their direct hours outside of your office. But if they can donate those three direct hours, that's 12 direct hours a month, right? Three a week, three times four is 12. And you're getting income from their clients, right? So this, uh, let me be clear, this is not your associate's practice, right? They're not renting office space from you. They're simply using your office space to see clients that are paying your practice to see that associate, right? So by doing that, yes, you are making income, 
but your associate is getting free supervision. So again, I call that the Anne's Place model. I love that model. It just works out so well. In fact, I hope some of my former supervisees, if they hear this podcast, that they comment on it because I, I still get uh, comments from them that it, it was such a relief to be able to have free supervision. And we had, oh gosh, I want to say at one time we had three offices in Montgomery County and we were able to deliver services and it was such a great impact on the community. And my supervisees, they weren't, you know, they were still able to get a ton of hours because I said, no, no, I only want 12 hours a month. I don't want you, yeah, just because you can do more, I don't want you to do more. I still want you to get the majority of your hours in other settings. So it was a great balance. They were able to dip their toe into private practice. I still was able to make income, you know, as I would have if I'd been charging them for supervision, but the community was helped. My supervisees were helped. It was a win, win, win. I love that. Um, another thing that, that folks can consider is hiring their supervisees. If you're a supervisor and you're interested in growing, um, so uh, remember a second ago, I was talking to the supervisor who, who just had a few hours available in their office, right? Not a group practice owner. Anne's Place can work for the single practice person, right? You aren't in your office 24 hours a day, I hope. So anytime you're not using those hours, that's that is, works great for the Anne's Place model. Now, if you are the person who's like, no, I'm ready to grow. I'm ready to have a group practice. You're going to want to listen to some of our podcast episodes from our group practice summit presenters last summer. We had some great presenters. I'll put those links in the show notes as well. So you can hear how to create a policy and procedures manual, how to create an orientation, how to make sure you're classifying your supervisees correctly. I promise it's easier than you think. And it's a great business model. It's, it's not hard to do. What we often hear about, and uh, this is sort of, a, well, not sort of, I'm going to be, let me be very clear. We are going to dive into this this year in the Texas Supervisor Coalition. I'm going to get a speaker to come in and talk to us more about labor laws, because when you hire someone, it's really not hard on the front end if you've set it up correctly. What's hard is if you've made mistakes like misclassifying people and then you've got to pay taxes and then you've got to worry about cleaning up all this stuff on the other side. So having uh, or hiring your supervisees is wonderful. It's a great business model. It's a great way for those of you who want that big practice so that you can cut back on your client hours and you can sort of let this, this practice impact your community while you're able to, to kind of fall into more of the manager role. It's a wonderful business plan. It's a great way to have income and to, like I was saying, impact everyone. But you've got to do your homework on the front end. So what would that be? Things like, you know, visit your community's chamber of commerce. They have small business development volunteers who will sit with you and help you develop a business plan. Uh, listen to my podcast about 1099 versus W-2. Sign up for our speaker this year who's going to talk about how to make sure you're not misclassifying. Sit down with an accountant and talk about how you want to be structured, right? Do you want to be an LLC, a PLLC, a 501c3 nonprofit, or an S-corp, right? There are tax benefits. So again, wonderful business model, but you've got to do your homework on the front end so you're not cleaning up messes on the back end. But we need you to hire those supervisees. We need associates who, uh, just like I always say, they're too important to lose to going out of business or to be working in a place that's not classifying them co correctly or who's not teaching them how to pay quarterly taxes or something like that. So let's review. The three business plans that I'm talking about today for supervisors. So I kind of 
combined three at the very beginning. And this was about standing out in the crowd because Texas is a buyer's market for supervisors, offering telehealth, considering a specialty and private practice mentoring. So those types of things are really going to help an associate choose you. So if you're ready to take on one, two, three associates, and you just want to make sure you stand out from the other supervisors, offering telehealth, offering a specialty, or offering private practice mentoring and charging accordingly is a great business model. Um, the Anne's Place model, right? Requiring your supervisees to give you three direct hours a week in exchange for free supervision. And then of course, those of you who want to grow that group practice, do your homework and hire your supervisees. Just make sure you classify them correctly and you get some mentoring through your small business development and your chamber of commerce and great resources like this, right? Kate Walker Training, Texas Counselors Creating Badass Businesses and the Step It Up membership where every Tuesday, you could be right here asking me questions because at the end of the training, I hit pause on the recording and then we just open it up for questions. And when Facebook is cooperating, then I'm even live streaming that in our closed Facebook group. So that's what I'm gonna do right now. I'm gonna hit pause on the recording and see if we have any questions. Thanks for listening.